Welcome to Online Worship with Tremont United Methodist Church. My name is Pastor Larry, and I am so privileged to be the lead pastor of this awesome congregation. I miss you all. Whether you're joining us as a regular member of this church or, or you're a guest with us this morning, we thank you for joining us this morning. I hope that you'll take a few moments to pass the attendance pad by filling out our online attendance card. The link is a link to the video uh, here to register your attendance and, and pass along any prayer requests uh, that you have. I wanna share with you just a couple of announcements. Uh, like we shared last week, our content is now able to be delivered to you through the Bible app. We're taking the scripture thing really seriously. We want all the people in our church to be seriously engaged with the word of God, uh, the scripture. So if you download the Bible app and you go to events, you'll be able to find each week content for Tremont United Methodist Church. While we're in this social distancing time and not able to meet together, our order of worship can be found there. Uh, a link to uh, give an offering, our prayer requests, announcements will be there. Uh, and what's there now and what will continue to be there even after we're back together is uh, a, a field guide, a field guide for daily prayer. Uh, it's a PDF that you can download. It has uh, daily prayers and psalms for you to read uh, to aid you in your discipleship and prayer time. But there's also questions there for you to discuss together uh, as, as with your spouse, uh, with your family, with your life group. And there's a table talk for families there that Daniel's putting together for uh, families with young children to enter into this story as well. And whether you have your table talk at dinner one night or uh, you have another time set aside, this is an opportunity uh, for all of us to grow in our discipleship uh, together. So I hope you'll uh, make good use of that. Uh, one other announcement I want to share, I want to remind you that the front doors to the church remain open, just the inner doors are locked, for you to drop off food donations of... Um, uh, for our, our local food pantry, there's a list of the items that they need most, and for weekend snack bags through the school. Another thing we're doing at the weekend snack bags, the, the school has done an incredible job of uh, ordering, packing, and distributing these snack bags that, that make sure that families who normally get a lunch during the week from the school have something on the weekends as well. And they've been handing out over 100 of these bags uh, every Friday. Uh, they're probably not going to be reimbursed by the state, and we don't want to take that risk, so we're stepping up uh, and we're paying for these snack bags. In addition to what normally comes in from the churches in town, it costs about $500 a week. I want to let you know that last week, you guys killed it. We were able to totally take care of, um, uh, of, of that need, and I want to say to you, keep it up. You can, you can write a check and mark it for weekend snack bags, or you can give online and just leave in the comments weekend snack bags. Let's be the church that forms this great partnership with our school and takes care of this need. So our school administrators who are doing an awesome job right now don't have to worry about this. One other announcement that I almost forgot about. Some of you have asked about the upper room. Uh, we're, we found a way to make those available uh, for you in the Narthex area where you drop off food donations if you want the paper copy. But the upper room, uh, a, a daily devotional that many people in our church use, has made the May and June version of the upper room available as a free PDF, and we're putting that link out there for you as well. Let's uh, join together and worship our great God. Let's pray together. Father, I welcome you into this place, into this, uh, this holy place where I am, in the sanctuaries that we have all made in our living rooms, in our kitchens, around our dining room tables, in our bedrooms, on our back patios. And I pray that you would come into all of these sanctuaries and you would fill us with your Holy Spirit, that we might worship you in spirit and in truth, as you call all of your followers to do. It's in the name of Christ that we pray. Amen. Let's worship together.
It's good to be back with you again um, to this long story short. Uh, today's message is about Abraham and Sarah and God calling them to be obedient. Uh, but like most people, we don't always obey God when he calls us. And sometimes we don't even realize that he has called us into obedience. And it leads me to my question for you, which is, have you ever wanted something so bad that you just couldn't wait to receive it? I'm guessing that most of us are in that situation right now where there's a ton of other things that we'd like to do, but we have to wait until we can experience that. And that's what it's like in a life of following God, where he doesn't give what we want or what we ask from him immediately. Uh, it's something that we have to be patient and live life in obedience in order to receive. So whether that's waiting till Christmas to get that gift that we really want or waiting till our birthday. Um, some of you uh, may want your driver's license already. You're sitting there in second grade waiting to the day that you can drive. Um, I'm waiting to get pinkies. I can't wait to go back um, and get pinkies um, and be able to spend time with all of you um, while we're there. So God doesn't always work in the timing that we want, but we can see in the story with Abraham and Sarah that he promises them a child 
and he promises it to Abraham that he'll have a son. And Abraham says, well, when will that be? And it's throughout this entire time of him following God that he delivers on his promise and gives him a son named Isaac. And we can see through his son Isaac that God has promised that living a life of holiness means living a life in obedience. And living a life in obedience equals getting to share an opportunity with God to receive his blessings. So in this time, remember the God's blessings that he's given to us so that way we can share it with others. In response to God's goodness to us, we have the opportunity now to give back to God his tithes and our offerings. We have multiple ways that uh, you can do that. One is to go ahead and mail your check to the church. We have folks who are coming in daily, checking that and taking care of our mail. You can give online, or if you, uh, you can scan the Q-scan right there on your screen. And we appreciate your faithful giving. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Almighty God, we ask that you bless this time of our giving back to you. Continue to provide for us during this difficult time, Lord. We lean into you and we trust you. Um, we ask that you bless this offering. Use it, Lord, transform it and increase it for um, the work of your kingdom right here in Tremont and around the world. We will give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us affirm our faith together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
take a moment now and go to the Lord in prayer. We'll take just a couple of seconds beforehand and allow you all at home to uh, have a time of silent prayer, and then we will pray together. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Sovereign God, we give you thanks that you meet with us this morning. We thank you, Lord, that we don't have to all be in one place for you to be sitting right next to us. For the way in which we are all disconnected, but you hold us together. We are grateful, Lord, that you meet us right where we are. Lord, we are also grateful that we have this opportunity to worship. It may seem um, a little different and maybe a little scattered, but Lord, I am so grateful that we can still worship, that we can still sense your presence, that we can still know that you are with us, right beside us, holding us, walking with us through this time. And so, Lord, we are mindful of those who have taken time and shared their concerns, been vulnerable enough to share their concerns. And this morning, Lord, we are, we are mindful of those who are grieving. There are layers of grief during this season in our lives. And so, Lord, we just pray this morning that you would hold those tight that are grieving. Allow them to sense a fresh, just a fresh sense of your presence with them. And Lord, it's a scary time if you already have a medical condition and still need to travel back and forth for treatment of whatever, whatever that looks like. And so, Lord, we are praying for those folks, that you walk with them, that you go with them. I pray for healing and wholeness. And Lord, we're mindful of those who have just prayer needs of all sorts, I can't list them all, Lord, because I would miss many of them. And there are so many prayer needs that don't even have a voice yet, that we don't even have on the list. When we are fearful, Lord, we rest assured that you can be trusted, that you are the ultimate provider, that you are not in surprise of anything that we go through. And so we lean into that and and we pray those promises this day. We are grateful, Lord, for all of the blessings that we do see coming out of all of this uh, tragic time. There are people that are reaching out in ways in which they might not have even thought of. Cards are being written, letters are being sent, phone calls are being made. Lord, may we never take any of that for granted again. We stand in awe, Lord, that you are still on the throne. This is no surprise to you. And although we have questions, you are still in control. We look to you for guidance. We trust you in provision. And we depend upon you, Lord, for our future. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus who taught his disciples to pray saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You were the word at the beginning, one with God, the Lord most high.
Pray with me. Grant, O oh God, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of each of our hearts would indeed find acceptance in your sight, God who is our strength and our redeemer. For it's in the name of Christ that we pray. Amen. Have you ever looked at your family tree and thought, man, this tree's full of nuts? I have. I can't tell you how many times I've been at a family gathering or hearing a story about what cousin such and such is, is up to or, or seeing what Uncle Who's It is posting on Facebook. And I've looked at Brittany and said, my family really puts the funk in dysfunctional. Am I alone in that? I didn't think so. Here's the good news that I begin with today. God redeems dysfunction. God brings transformation to that dysfunction. And I can say that in full confidence, not even knowing the details of your story or whatever dysfunction is a part of you or your family, because I've seen grace bring healing to countless people. And I know the, that grace has brought healing and redemption to my own story. But I don't know it just from firsthand experience. I know it because I've seen it in the Bible. And one of the things that I'm trying to instill in us through this series is, is an understanding that in the stories of the Bible, you don't just find the stories of God, ancient stories, you find your story too. So we're in week three of this sermon series, Long Story Short, and we're putting all of the puzzle pieces together to see the big picture of Scripture and, and understand the relevance and importance and authority of the Scriptures for us still today. We're tracing six movements in Scripture as outlined in the book, long story short, creation, fall, Israel, Jesus, church, new creation. And in the first week, we talked about creation, that all of the cosmos, and specifically you and me, were created completely and purposefully from and for community in the image of God. And last week, we considered the fall and we considered the damage and chaos that sin brings to us and to others and the entire world. But even in our sin and our brokenness, God shows incredible love and care for us that, that ultimately leads us back into relationship with him. And this week, we're moving to that next movement, Israel. And what I want to point out is that even though there are four remaining movements, these four, Israel, Jesus, church, new creation, they all really fall under one main category. What I'm saying is that they are smaller subsections of a major theme. So scripture is really only divided into three broad movements, creation in Genesis 1 and 2, fall in Genesis 3, and then everything else that comes after that is under the big umbrella of redemption. And that's really important for us to understand. In the first three chapters of the Bible, we get the first two movements of Scripture, creation and fall. That escalated quickly. But everything else after that, after creation and fall, is about rescue and redemption. And that's really good news. So here we are. Redemption. Subsection one. Israel. We're going to be looking at the story of one family and one future nation called Israel. And in order to understand the big picture of the Bible story, we have to understand this family's story. Their story ultimately fills 39 books of the Old Testament. And no, I'm not going to preach through all 39 books. Instead, we're going to summarize the whole story of Israel in, in three ways that I think describe our redemption as well. So I'm trying to condense this, this massive story of Israel down so that we can all have a basic understanding of, of, of what the Bible and the Old Testament in general means to us still yet today. So here's the question that we're going to look at today. How is Israel's story my story? First, like Israel, we are people of destiny. To understand the story of Israel, we need to understand the call of one couple, the story begins with an unlikely man and his wife. They're, they're childless. They're raising their nephew. They live in a time and a place where there were lots of different pagan gods that the people worshipped. But their lives are forever changed when the Lord, the God who created the heavens and the earth, speaks to them. Let's take a look at that in Genesis chapter 12, 
verses one through four. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you. I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him. Abram's called to leave behind three things, his country, his relatives, his home. He's being told to go out and start a whole new thing, just, just he and Sarai. And where are they going? To the land that I will show you. Thanks a lot, God. Uh, he's, he's, Abram is totally clueless about where he's going. He's leaving behind everything that he's known to go after something that he doesn't know. But God promises him some, some new things. God promises to make Abram a nation, a land, and a blessing. I'm going to make you into a great nation. I'm going to give you a land of your own, and through you and your descendants, all the peoples of the world will be blessed. God is essentially saying, I want you to leave behind what you know because of what I know I'm going to do through you. God has a destiny for Abram and Sarai. It's a plan for a childless, childless man to be known as Father Abraham. A few chapters later, God tells Abram to try to count the stars because he's going to have more descendants than the stars. And this has to be really hard for a man with no children of his own to understand. Yet he went for it. He made himself available uh, to God and, and available to God's destiny Whatever confusion he had, whatever debate was raging inside of his mind, whatever his doubts were, no matter what comfort he was leaving behind, everything he had known, he sets it all aside to go, as the Lord had told him. And I really identify with this story a lot. Uh, you, you know my story. You know how radical my initial encounter with Jesus was. I was dragged to a week of church camp as a fairly convinced atheist. I responded to Jesus and became a Christian. And within 24 hours of that initial experience with Jesus, I felt called to be a pastor. I didn't even know what preachers did yet. I had other plans. I really thought that I was going to be an English teacher or a history teacher. But, but right there, the call was so undeniable so undeniable that I knew it was my destiny. So I said yes to leaving behind my plans, my idea of comfort, my ambition to follow God's call wherever he would lead and, and through the United Methodist Church, wherever the bishop would send me. And as I've gone on in my life, I realized that this call was about way more than being a pastor. It was about a rhythm of saying yes to Jesus. Over and over, God calls and tells us to leave behind things that we cling to in order to receive more than we could think or imagine. And you, yes, you, right there in your living room, you're a person of destiny too. You are called to belong to Jesus. And your call may not, to be, a, may not be to be a pastor, though never say never, but your call is about your character, a call to leave behind what you cling to in order to receive what God alone can offer. Before God formed you, he knew you. The Bible says that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. God pursued you and desired a relationship with you. God wants to set you apart for a call that is unique to you to love and serve and bless others and this world. So what are you holding on to that God might be asking you to let go of? What's standing in the way of your destiny? Is it fear? Comfort? Your plans? Your pride? God's destiny for your life and mine waits for us, and all we have to do is go, like Abram and Sarai, where he leads us. As we continue with the story of, of Abram that will lead to Israel, we see their story is like ours in that we are a people of destiny and we are a people of disobedience. Abram and Sarai take off for an unknown destination and God leads them to what we know as the promised land. 
But a famine soon leads them to Egypt, and this is where Abram gets afraid, and he begins to cut corners in his following of God. He lies about Sarai's identity. She she was quite beautiful, and Abram was afraid that those in power might kill him to try to take her, so he tells people that she's his sister. Well, one thing leads to another, and Pharaoh takes her as his wife, and when the truth finally comes out, they're kicked out of Egypt. During their stay, both Abram and his nephew Lot acquire great wealth, and this newfound fortune would eventually drive them apart from one another. As trouble dawns on this family, things get worse between Sarai and Abram. They get impatient waiting for God's promise to to come true and for them to have a child in their old age. That's when Sarai has an idea. She'd left Egypt with a female servant, and she has an idea that's recorded for us in Genesis 16, verses 1 through 2. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had not been able to bear children for him, but she had an Egyptian servant named Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, The Lord has prevented me from having children. Go and sleep with my servant. Perhaps I can have children through her. And Abram agreed with Sarai's proposal. You heard that correctly. She tells her husband to go sleep with another woman so that they can have a child. Can you imagine how that conversation went? Together, they think that they can fulfill God's promise in their own way according to their own schedule. And it's not actually that strange of an idea. It was a common solution to barrenness in that culture, but it's not what God had promised to them. They're called to trust in God, not to make their own plans. The servant Hagar does become pregnant. She does bear a child whom they name Ishmael. And Hagar and Sarai start to fight all the time because she thinks that she's better than Sarai because she can have children. And it goes on and on. It's a really kind of a reality TV show. And Sarai finally has enough of the disrespect and she basically says, "Uh uh-uh, not in my house, girlfriend. She starts to treat Hagar so badly that she runs away with Ishmael into the wilderness. And this conflict would persist Ishmael would grow up to struggle to get along with his relatives. Who would have thought that growing up in a home full of conflict and anger would be a bad thing for a kid? And this family drama, it's still playing out in our world. Jews and Christians, uh, we trace our, our spiritual ancestry to the line of Isaac, whom we'll get to in a moment. Muslims, however, trace their ancestry to Ishmael. The family drama continues. Destiny drove this family to follow God, but their disobedience threatens to tear them apart. Can anyone relate to that? Have you ever disobeyed God's call on your life? Do you struggle with anger or is your disobedience a, a, a hidden addiction or affliction that's become just part of who you are? Is it a grudge that you hold? Is it your pride? Is it well-masked selfishness? Is it money mismanagement? Are you disobeying God's call to keep your eyes from wandering and your feet from going where they should not? Are you wasting time on social media trapped in a never-ending game of comparison competition and keeping up with the Joneses? The possibilities for disobedience are almost endless. And just like when we talked about the consequences of sin last week, here's what I don't want you to miss because it's really good news. Even when everything went all reality TV for Abram and and Sarai, God didn't give up on them. He kept his promises. They They were the least likely couple to use to bless the world when God first called them, and they pretty much made the odds worse with all of their drama. Yet God keeps his promises. God comes to Abram again. And Abram answers again. God calls him to live a a blameless life again. He establishes a covenant with him and, and he gives them new names. Abraham and Sarah. And the Lord even provides incredible care for Hagar and Ishmael. Because like our story, the story of Israel is destiny. It's disobedience. And like Israel... We are a people of deliverance. Abraham and and Sarah have a lot more adventures that you can read about in Genesis. But God finally delivers on his promise. Imagine the joy of this dysfunctional, disobedient couple caught up in the destiny of God. 
when this happens in Genesis 21, 1 through 3. The Lord dealt with Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he had promised. Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the time of which God had spoken to him. Abraham gave the name Isaac to his son, whom Sarah bore to him. God kept his word. He did exactly what he promised. They named their son Isaac, which means laughter. Because it's, it's a pretty laughable situation, right? An old couple well into their 70s, you're going to have a child? Sarah actually laughs early on when Abraham tells her this. So they named their son Laughter. The childless are childless no more. The childless father Abraham finally has a baby with his own wife. God specializes in bringing order to dysfunction. Long story short, Isaac grows up to marry Rebekah. They have twin boys, Esau and Jacob. Jacob means trickster. And, and this was true of him from the very first moment. Scripture says that, that he uh, was born clinging to the heel of his brother Esau, trickster. And he spends the rest of his life doing that, lying, cheating, stealing his way to the top. Anyway, long story short, he has an encounter with God where he, where he wrestles with God. And we've all wrestled with God at some point. And at the end of the encounter, God changes his name from Jacob to Israel, he who wrestles. Israel has 12 sons. Each one grows up to lead one of the 12 tribes of Israel. And from one of them, one of those tribes, the tribe of Judah, another unlikely and unexpected couple have a child born in yet another supernatural birth. His name Yeshua, Jesus. We are a people of destiny. We're a people of disobedience, but we're a people of deliverance. God comes through on his promise to Abraham and Sarah, and he does the same over and over and over again in the Old Testament until at just the right time he sends the deliverer. He sends the deliverer to rescue and restore every person who would follow him. God does this over and over for us as well. No matter who you are or what you've done, God brings his promises to you. Now, the story of Abraham and Sarah is a very important story to the Old Testament, but it's, not, it's obviously not the only story of Israel. There are 38 more books in the Old Testament filled with stories about Israel. But Israel's story follows a pretty familiar pattern it's kind of like the directions on my shampoo bottle here. Um, most of you, if you've ever been bored enough to read the instructions on your shampoo, it says wash, rinse, repeat. Well, mine's from uh, Dollar Shave Club, and the directions are different. Lather, wander, rinse. And that's basically the story of Israel. In every story you read in the Old Testament, one of these three things is taking place. God is, is lathering people up, helping them to discover their destiny. People are wandering, disobeying God's call. Or God is rinsing. He's delivering them yet again. That's the pattern of the story of Israel. It's absolutely as predictable as lather, wander, rinse. It is destiny it's disobedience, it's deliverance. That's Israel's story over and over and over again until Jesus comes. And the story moves beyond the people of Israel to everyone. And because of Jesus, we too get invited into this story and sometimes we have a really hard time accepting that. We say things like, there's no way I could be a part of God's story. There's a voice inside us that says, I'm not good enough, or if you only knew what I've done. But that's why the scriptures, the Bible is so important. Because the Bible doesn't hide how messed up or dysfunctional people like Abraham and Sarah are. Yet God still chooses them to write a major part of his story. 
God knows everything about Abraham and Sarah, and yet he still calls them. God specializes in taking messed up, broken people and using them for incredible things. Danielle Strickland is an incredible uh, preacher, pastor, and, and teacher. Uh, and her story of deliverance is, is incredible as well. She was a teenager in Canada um, who found herself incarcerated as a, as a juvenile. She was, she was drug addicted and had all sorts of uh, trouble with the law, and her, her life was miraculously changed by, by Jesus. And for 22 years, she dedicated herself as an officer in the Salvation Army, serving appointments in the UK and Canada and in Australia. And she has dedicated herself to serving people on the margins, specifically bringing women out of sex trades, women out of addiction, out of exploitation, and into freedom that comes through a relationship with Jesus. I want to share with you a story that she tells about a woman whose street name was Pocahontas. And you know, it's fascinating. You know, we had this one uh, woman volunteer. We had this street uh, van outreach that goes out on the street, my last uh, appointment in Canada. And it goes out every night on the street and it just kind of goes along women who are stuck and exploited and pimped, whatever it is. And it invites them into this like little truck that's like a mobile living room where we kind of love on people and give them what they need and offer them a ride home or get them into shelter, whatever it is, and pray for them and all sorts of things. And we used to always go by this woman named uh, Pocahontas. That was her street name. And she was on this one particular corner of the street. And Pocahontas is exactly the picture of hopelessness. She had been exploited since she was 12. She injecting drug user, HIV positive. Uh, you know, on a, literally on the streets, like skin and bones with a crutch because she was losing her legs from diabetes and uh, unkept medical problems. And every night we would drive by Pocahontas and I would, because I've been doing this for so long, I would in my own mind rehearse the tragedy. You know, I, I would think it through and think, I wonder if this is the night I'm gonna have to you know, nurse my team through the death of Pocahontas, you know. And this one member volunteer named Christine, a good friend of mine, she, for some reason, the Lord just kind of spoke to her and said, I want you to pay attention to Pocahontas. I want you to stop every night for Pocahontas. I want you to pray for Pocahontas. So she would always be like, I got this feeling for Pocahontas. Like, I think we should pray for Pocahontas. And I'd just be like, oh, for Pete's sake. I wouldn't say that outside because I'm a leader, so we don't do that on the outside. We only do those things on the inside. So on the outside, I was like, oh, that's amazing. But on the inside, I was like, oh, brother. <laughs> one day, Pocahontas gets on the van. Every time I tell you, I thought she wasn't going to be there. We, get, we, we pull up this one day, Pocahontas gets on the van. Christine says, Pocahontas, I feel like the Lord wants me to pray for you. Pocahontas says, skip the prayer, take me to the hospital. We're like, what? Every night, we asked her if she would go to the hospital. Every night, we asked her if she wanted to go to treatment. Every night, we wanted to ask her if she would go to a ward, and she would never say yes, never say yes, never say yes. She gets in the van. She said, take me to the hospital. She gets to the hospital. She said, okay, if you want to pray, pray that God will help me keep my legs. They say they're going to have to take my legs. You pray that God will uh, let me keep my legs. And doctor comes in, did some tests. Doctor says, you can keep your legs. Christine said, told you. Pocahontas said, well, forget that I'm wanted for seven years, they're asking. I'm wanted on all these bail, you know, things. I've skipped bail for most of my life. So she said, I'm wanted, got to go to court. You, you think your God is real? Tell him to keep me out of jail. She said, fine. Prays for Pocahontas to stay out of jail. <laughs> gets, gets to jail and the court says, the judge says, actually, I think you need drug treatment center instead of jail. So we're going to give you drug treatment center instead. Christine says, I told you so. Tana said, yeah. Holy cow, she gets to drug treatment center and she prays. She said, okay, God, if you're so real, all I want to do right now is use heroin. If you're so real right now, take this desire, take this urge, take this overwhelming desire for me to use heroin, take it away. The next day she has no desire to use heroin. Pocahontas comes to this revelation. Holy crap, she said. I think God might be real. <laughs> and she started a relationship with Jesus that included forgiveness, that included freedom, that began to inc include clean time, that began to include counseling and emotional healing. It actually began to incorporate this whole entire life. I was just with Pocahontas, whose real name is Tannis, in the UK last weekend, where she's ministering on the streets, uh, rescuing women on the streets who are saying, don't pray for me. You're never gonna guess what she says. <laughs> she says, I'm gonna pray for you anyway. <laughs> Too bad for you. 
because this Jesus I want to tell you about is not some sort of Hallmark special. This Jesus is not some sort of Disney after school special. This Jesus is real. This Jesus is real life. This Jesus is personal. This Jesus can touch and can feel and to go to the dark spots. Pocahontas, Tannis, Danielle, you, me, Abraham, Sarah, Israel, we are people of destiny, disobedience, but also of deliverance. That's our story. God has a destiny for us. We have disobeyed God's destiny and call in our lives, but he delivers us anyway and continues to write us into his story. Not hiding how messed up and broken we are, but using how messed up and broken we are to be transformed by his power and his love so that like Abraham and Sarah, we can bless others. Part of the story that we've been written into is the story of deliverance. That's the story of the Old Testament. That's the story of Israel. Destiny, disobedience. Oh, but the deliverance is good. Let's pray together. God, I thank you for the destiny that you have for each one of us. That even when we disobey, you're still about deliverance. So be with us now as we move into this stage of studying scripture. We understand the creation from and for community. We understand the effects of the fall of sin. And now we move to your story of redemption and rescue. And that's the story of Israel. So help us to know our destiny, to understand the call that you have given to us. And help us to celebrate and accept the deliverance that you offer to us in Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. One of the things that I'm really excited that we get to do uh, this week is, is celebrate Holy Communion together. That's probably the thing that I've missed the most uh, about being together. And there are so many things I miss about being together physically. I look at all of the empty pews and I imagine the faces that are supposed to be there. And I, I miss the handshakes and the hugs. Uh, I miss the, the looks on y'all's faces as, uh, as, we, uh, as we worship together. But I've missed sharing together in communion. Because in the Wesleyan Methodist tradition, we have this rich theology of Holy Communion. We believe in what's called the real presence of Christ. And what that means is that when the, when the, the elements are consecrated by those who are authorized to do so, and we share them together, that Jesus really is present in the bread and the cup. So that's been one of the things that we've been missing throughout this COVID-19 um, shutdown uh, some churches and traditions are, are, are celebrating communion online uh, in this, uh, this really strange time that we're in. It's not something that really, really jives with our, our doctrinal stances uh, as a church. And uh, because of that, and also wanting to respect the, um, the orders that have been given to us uh, by, uh, by our government officials, uh, we haven't been able to celebrate Holy Communion. So I've really been thinking of a way for us to do this. And earlier this week, I sent out a video explaining all of this and invited people to, um, to uh, sign up to have prepackaged communion elements uh, delivered to them. They're called fellowship cups, and they have, uh, they have a piece of unleavened bread in there and the, and the juice. So uh, if you were somebody who got that scheduled, uh, take that out now. If you missed that opportunity and you still want Holy Communion, uh, contact me today. I'll be happy to drop uh, these, these consecrated elements um, on, on your uh, front porch uh, for you to commune uh, with all of us. And uh, if, you, if you don't want the elements, you don't want communion, we have an opportunity for spiritual uh, communion as well. So let's celebrate Jesus. Let's celebrate the story that God draws us into as we celebrate the table of our Lord. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors 
and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God and spoke to us through the prophets. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, ate with sinners and invited us into your story. By the baptism of his suffering, death and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made with us a new covenant by water and the spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit, that your story would become ours. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered together in living rooms and around kitchen tables and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. So take your uh, fellowship cup and uh, pull off the top. Are you wafer? We're all struggling with them, I promise. Now we go. Okay, the body of Christ given for us. And the blood of Christ shed for us. For those who cannot receive Holy Communion at this time, we offer the following prayer. My Jesus, I believe that you are truly present in this Holy Sacrament. I love you above all things and I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot at this moment receive you in the sacrament, come spiritually into my heart. I embrace you and unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. Let's pray together. Almighty God, I give you thanks for giving yourself to us in this holy mystery. Grant that we might be your disciples and your hands and feet in this world, proclaiming your story as we give ourselves for others. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
Let's proclaim the goodness of our God and, and pray that God might speak to us through his story, the Bible, as we sing together, Word of God Speak. hope that you take opportunity this week to make God's story your story. That's what we're talking about with Long Story Short, that God has this cosmic pattern when it comes to redemption and rescue, and he invites us into that story as well. May the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen. See you next week. Thank you for watching, mates. I hope you have a great week. <laughs> Wash your hands.